The Rav has spoken positively about listening to non-Jewish classical music, where the composer infuses the music with noble human emotions. In a separate vein, the vein we also know that music written from Bodhisattva is usher to listen to. While it may be easy for us to avoid evangelical gospel rock music, um, the issue becomes much more subtle when we have uh, many classical music masterpieces, such as Mozart's Requiem, Bach's Ave Maria, or Handel's Date of the Priest. Some pieces of this so-called sacred music genre are inspired by Tanakh events, some have lyrics that are religious but not necessarily Christian, and some have no lyrics at all. How do we approach listening to music uh, with such Christian origins? Yeah, so again, I, I'm always asked to repeat the question, so I'll repeat it uh, quickly. The, the issue is uh, classical music, and much of the great classical music was specifically written uh, for church music, uh, pra uh, praises to Yashka, whatever it would be, and uh, the question would become that even if you don't have lyrics, even if you don't have the lyrics that are saying praises, uh, but they were written for that particular purpose, so would there be a problem of getting benefit from Avodazora uh, by listening to that type of, of music? Can I, can, I, you know, can I listen to Bach? I mean, Bach, for example, almost everything Bach wrote. Uh, is connected to, Bach was a very religious person in his religion, and the question becomes, does that make it usher for me? Let's listen. Mozart was probably an apicorist, so Mozart was a different situation. So, um, it's an interesting machlokas. First of all, first of all, uh, what, you, what you stated as your assumption is not necessarily true. You had said that if something was written uh, for the church, uh, it would be an isser of getting benefit from Avodazara. You know, that's not necessarily so for, for the following reason. If you think about it, let's assume you have the author, right, Bach, the composer. The composer wrote it uh, for church worship. It's now being uh, played for its performance value by the New, the New York Philharmonic, who's not necessarily having any particular religious thought at all. Now, are you benefiting from Avodah Zorah when you're hearing not the music as played in the actual church, but kind of a performance reproduction of that music, which is not necessarily linked to religion. Uh, do you say that the notes themselves are somehow uh, Avodah Zarah? So Me'ikar Hadin, it actually would be mutter to hear uh, even church music if, if number one, it's, the, uh, it's divorced from the lyrics, and number two, you're not hearing it as part of a performance that is a religious worship itself. And I think you have to differentiate between listening to a church service versus listening to a, a secular orchestra playing music that may have been composed for a church service. So Mi'ikara din it is mutra. And in fact, in fact, there were uh, the Bach uh, re references the fact that there was some chazanas, there was some uh, synagogue music that was taken from church music. Now, Lamaisa, that's Mi'ikara Din. Uh, the Makubalim take a very, very different view of this, as I'm sure you've heard over the years. Uh, in Kabbalah, there's a concept that the author somehow puts in his intentions into the music itself, and therefore uh, the music kind of absorbs the kavanos of the author, and when you listen to that music, you become influenced by the kavanos of the author uh, and the like. So al pi Kabbalah, there would certainly be a basis to be strict, uh, but in terms of strict halacha, there would not be a problem. Now, I will say, I mentioned before, that um, there were some gedolim who listened to classical music, and as far as I understand, they did not differentiate between, say, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, or any of these other guys. Uh, Mendel Kaplan, was, uh, who was a great, uh, you may not have heard of him, but uh, he was a great, great Talmud Chacham. He was a Talmud of Rabbi Chanan Wasserman and uh, he was a long-time uh, Rebbe in the Philadelphia Yeshiva for many, many years. He was actually Rabbi Beryl Wine's Rebbe, uh, both in Chicago and, 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 and later. And Rabbi Mendel Kaplan used to listen to classical music, and when someone asked him, what, what are you listening to these Goyim, or Menu Volum even, uh, Beethoven, for example, his behavior was not always morally ideal. And he said they put into the music the good part of their characters. Now, in a sense, what's interesting about that is it's a little almost tarty to sasrate, because on one hand we're saying it's not tainted by Avodah Zorah because the music is a neutral medium, but at the same time the music does convey qualities of courage and perseverance. And whatever. In other words, it does absorb something, but it doesn't necessarily absorb the religious 
on messages. So I would think under a matter of strict halacha, it would be permitted, provided you're not actually listening to a worship or church performance, and provided that uh, it does not have the lyrics that are religiously uh, offensive to us. So, uh, yeah, right, sorry. So like a requiem, like, you know, these records have the lyrics that choral that one should stay away from. I think one should stay away from anything which is verbalizing uh, lyrics that are uh, Avodah Zorah or Keneged uh, Torah. By the way, Christian, I mean, this, is not, this is not your question at all, but uh, as I've said many times, I mean, you are aware that in the Rishainim there is a huge, huge machlokas about what is the halachic status of Christianity. Uh, and that is, uh, the shita of the Rambam is that Christianity, now obviously this is pre-Reformation, so he was not talking about every Protestant sect, but uh, the Rambam's opinion is that Christianity is idolatry, and the reason is because, number one, uh, they put divinity into a human form, and number two, the Trinity is a form of multiplicity of God. So for those two reasons, it is Avodah Zorah, but then we have the Shita of Rabbeinu Tam, who lived in Catholic France, Rashi's grandson, who says that although Christianity is an erroneous belief and is absolutely forbidden for a Jew to be a Christian, but under the Sheva Mitzvos B'nai Noach, under the Noachite law, it is not a Vodazara. Uh, so that's an interesting machlokas. But as I say, that wouldn't be relevant to your Shaila because even if it's not a Vodazara for a non-Jew, it's a Vodazara for a Jew. So as a result, I still would not be allowed to listen to those Christian lyrics. Yeah. Um, let's say some like your friend asks you, like you, you're working at a job, and he asks you, "Can you give me a job?" Or he asks, or let's say you work at an agency, and your friend asks you to show, like your your agent, let's say a performance of his, whatever it is, and you watch it, or you know that he's not he's not fit for the job or for the performance or for whatever it is. Where do you draw the line between like um, not embarrassing yourself in front of your boss and like not, you know? showing him like your friend's performance versus like your friend is asking you for a favor and you want to... Wait, I'll say, let, let me run this by you again. In other words, you have somebody who's applying for a job? Yeah, let's say somebody wants yep. a job or yep. let's say somebody's a singer and you know, you know a singer who, uh, and he asks you to put, to put him in touch with that singer. And okay. you don't think that he's good. And by doing that, you're just... Oh, I see, I see. So, so, so you're, you're, you're not being asked to express an opinion. Yeah, you're just... That would be a Lush and Hara problem. You're just asked to forward a yeah. performance and uh, you think uh, the guy's pretty bad and you're afraid that you're going to get embarrassed by forwarding yeah. a bad performance. Um, you no, know, it's an interesting question. I guess it depends how bad is bad. I mean, what, one of the things that you might bring up is to the person himself that may say, you might, you might tell your friend, yeah, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you could do a better, a better demo or a better performance. Maybe this is not the right way, thing to forward. Uh, but I'll tell you the truth. Um, I, I, I think I would err on the side of forwarding and let the person, let, let the boss decide. Let the, uh, you know, uh, you're not opining. When I forward some, something to somebody, I'm not necessarily endorsing it. I'm not saying I think it's good. I'm saying I received this and I'm just sending it on to you uh, for your perusal. I mean, I, I mean I, I'm in that position myself quite a lot of times. Uh, sometimes people ask me to make contact and I just forward. So, so you can kind of depend, what, you know, you can, you can gauge from my email what my really feel, real feeling is. If I like something, I will have a little cover letter saying, oh, this is great. If I don't like something, it'll just be a blind forward. <laughs> just forward it uh, and the like. So um, I, I don't think, you know, what you're worried about is so significant. I, mean, I would do the guy a favor and give him a chance, and who knows, maybe the boss is going to like it. I wouldn't worry too much about being embarrassed because, you know, you're not endorsing it, so I, I don't think necessarily you're going you're to be embarrassed. Now, I, I thought you were going to ask me a different question, which is also a good question, and that is, well, what if my boss asks me for my opinion about someone who's applying, and I don't think that person is qualified. Uh, is it Lashon Hara? Is it a negative thing for me to give a negative recommendation? I'm not allowed to say derogatory things about people, even if it's true. Uh, that is a good question. On the other hand, you know, you also have an obligation not to give, uh, not to uh, cause people to suffer a loss. So if this would be to the disadvantage of the employer, you are allowed to give your honest opinion about whether someone is competent or capable of the job without exaggeration, 
but you know, you could you it's not less than hard for you to give a negative performance evaluation. Uh, yeah. Uh, here's the sentence. I have heard there is a group of Orthodox people called Purushim. How are Purushim different from Haredim? <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is a reference to a, a group of Orthodox people called Pirushim, and uh, they are located within the world of Haredim, and they are a subunit of that. So first of all, let me point out that the word Purushim uh, has an old-fashioned, just like Hasidim, for example. Right? When, when you say the word Hasidim, we immediately think of followers of the Baal Shem Tov in their various denominations, uh, which started, let's say, in the 1700s. And yet, we also know that the Mishnah itself refers to Hasidim Harishonim. Do you remember the Mishnah in Brachos that says that the early Hasidim, the early pious ones, used to uh, daven uh, nine hours a day, essentially. They would prepare themselves an hour, they would daven for an hour, they would decompress for an hour. They did it three times. Why chakras and mincha had the same length is a little, a little interesting, but apparently they made their mincha as long as their chakras. And the Gemara asks, you're davening nine hours a day, when are you going to learn? And the answer is that because of their devout, their devout connection to Hashem, Hashem gave them a siyat de shmaya, that they could do gewaldic things in a shorter amount of time. So you see from that that the word chasidim didn't only mean the followers of the Baal Shem Tov, but it was used much earlier. Now, Purushim is exactly the same thing. Uh, if you learn Mishnayis and Chagiga and the like, we have Purushim are the Pharisees. The Pharisees, Chazal, versus the Sadducees, versus the Tztukim. So Purushim, which means the separate ones, the ones who were separated from Tuma and the like, was an old term for what we know as the, uh, many of the Tanoim, by the Amoram already, we didn't have that because that's already after the Beis HaMikdash, but the earlier Tanoim were Purushim. So that's the older usage. Now, the modern usage of Purushim, uh, which I think the question is referring to, uh, refers to people who are more or less very makbid to follow all of the Minhagim of the Grah. Now again, I, I've said many times, that the foundation of the Ashkenazic customs of Yerushalayim comes from the Talmidim of the Vilna Gaon, because until the 19th century, the Ashkenazim of Yerushalayim were very small in number. This was, this was basically a Sephardic town. And that is why Ravaj Yosef maintains, to the end of his life, that Ashkenazim have no, no right to exist here because every Ashkenazi that came to Yerushalayim was halachically obligated to adopt the Minhagim of Sfarad, and even though eventually Ashkenazim may have, may, may have become a majority, although it's not so clear, but let's assume even if Ashkenazim are a majority, Rav Ovadja applied the principle, kama kama bato, each one that comes in had to become bato to the majority. So Ashkenazim, we are totally illegitimate. Um, but, but nevertheless, what, what eventually happened in the 19th century was that the Garin, the foundation of the Ashkenazi community, were the Talmidim of the Vilna Gaon. They built, actually, many shchunot, many of the neighborhoods outside of the old city. So because of this, uh, many minhagim of Yerushalayim are the minhagim of the Gra. For example, Ashkenazim duchening every day. Now, Sephardim did it anyway. It's interesting, but we're not doing it because of Svardim. We're doing it because of the Minhagim of the Gra. That was the Sheet of the Gra. He even wanted to do it in Chutzlaretz, and he was not able to do it, but the Talmidim wanted to follow that. Uh, the idea that on Yamim Tovim, instead of saying the Shir Shal Yom, we say a special thing, which you know maybe you're not used to. Uh, that's the Minhag of the Gra, right? The special Shir, right? Now the thing is, though. Uh, we're very inconsistent. We're not fully following everything of the Gra. The Prushim are very, very makbid to follow the Minhagim of Gra exactly as they are in the Maise Rav. That's the uh, more or less definitive safer of the Minhagim of the Gra. So they created a, a subgroup, a subgroup within the Haredi world. So I would say uh, every Parush is Haredi, not every Haredi is, is Parush. And of course, uh, let me mention s very simply that Prushim are obviously non-Hasidic uh, Haredim. Uh, Prushim are Badafka, not connected to 
uh, Hasidus in any, in any way. And because of it, now again, uh, obviously over time, because it's be, been a separate Gehila, it, it, even besides the Grah, it's developed its own minhagim of its own, it's its own, you know, its own structure and the like. But I think in its Yesaid, it was an attempt to be very, very faithful to the Mesoras of the Vilna Gun. Uh, did you want to say? Yeah. Uh, this morning I finished a two and a half year project of uploading the entire Shas Mishnah in English to YouTube in honor of my father who had passed. Wow, Mazel so, Tov. Thank you very much. This is your own, I mean, your own work? I mean, my you, own work. Can I plug my channel? I want to ask you about uh, Masechus Nagayim and all those things. Uh, we'll, 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's called yeah. Mishnah in English. Now, I have Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. Thank you. So now I want desperately now to go to my dad's kever and let him know I did it. I have a few problems with this. Number yeah. one, I'm sorry. So I heard we don't, it's not the first year you don't go unless it's the yard site. And number two, he knows. He got a little, I learned. His he knows. Shines, <laughs> yeah. And that leads me to a second question. Does a person just stomp, visit a parent at a kever on a regular day, or is it min hak shlut? Tush, the guy's dead, you know? No, no, no. I mean, uh, I mean, listen. Obviously, we know we we don't we don't pray to the dead. We know all that. But the notion of visiting kvarim uh, does have a, a source in Chazal, and it does not automatically have to be tied to a specific day. In fact, I get this question a lot. People want to go on the yard side of their parents. They want to go to the kever, but especially if they're here and the kever is there, or vice versa, they can't always go exactly during that time. Uh, can they go before? Is there a purpose of going before? Uh, the answer is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a way that's especially when um, you have done or are doing some special learning, le'ili nishmata. Now, you are correct. Your, your father undoubtedly knows this already. But you can have it. But the truth is you can even make a shaliach to go. You can make a, a shaliach uh, to go to the kever on your behalf and say, you know, your son, Baruch Hashem, did this wonderful thing and... Uh, we hope that you'll, talking, yeah. Like, or just talking from here. No, 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 Ta talking, if I'm at the camera, I'm just talking random stuff. The Yankees won, I don't know, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, talk, <laughs> your father liked baseball, so <laughs> tell him about the World Series or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that, that he might, that, you know, that he might not know. That's interesting because, you know, they say Mason know the significant things that happen. So maybe he needs, needs to know the baseball scores, whatever it would be. Um, yeah, yeah, it's okay. In other words, it's a way of, uh, of establishing um, connection. And that's considered to be, you know, that's considered to be much or just it's a way of reuniting in some, in some way. Yeah, yeah. Is it worse to have a moral relation before marriage with a Goy or a Jew? Wow. Yeah, yeah, interesting question. Of course, uh, obviously both are, you know, both are absolutely forbidden. But if a person had to make a choice of the lesser of two evils, um, premarital relations or relations with a, with a non-Jew. So first of all, let, let's understand something about premarital relations with a Jewish woman. You have to understand there are two separate and distinct problems. And one problem is actually more severe. Problem number one is that according to many Rishayim, not everybody, there's an Isser de Arisa to have sexual relations outside of marriage. Uh, and this is the Shita of the Rambam, and this is the Psak of the Shulchan Aruch, that when the Torah says, Lo siya kidesha, a woman is not allowed to be a prostitute, the Rambam understands that's not referring just to prostitution, but that is a general rule of any marital intercourse outside of um, marriage. And the Rambam Shita is that the idea of Pilegesh, a concubine, is a special halachic dispensation for a king, and it doesn't apply to anybody else. So according to the Rambam, premarital intercourse with a Jewish woman is an is outside of marriage, yeah, premarital, is an iser da'o raisa. Now there are some Rishonim that argue, there are, there are Rishonim that say that if this is a committed relationship, it's called a Pilegesh, and it's mutter even for a Hedjite, there is such a shita, and that was uh, Rav Yaakov Emden felt a halacha lemaisi could do such a thing. Our minog is absolutely to follow the psak of the Shulchan Aruch. But you have to understand that there's a much, much more serious problem than the prohibition of premarital intercourse, and that is a single woman generally has not gone to the mikvah. 
And if a single woman has not gone to the mikvah and she's had her period, halachically she is a nida. Now having intercourse with a nida, even if it's your own wife, is a chi of kares, right? Your chi of you know, death in the hands of heaven. And uh, that's going to be much more chamer because even like the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch, premarital relations is a low sasa, but it's not a chi of kares. If she's a nida, there's a chi of kares. So you have to keep, in fact, this is an interesting dilemma that rabbis sometimes have to face. Uh, what if I have a Baal Shuvah couple, or let's say a, a couple that's in the process of becoming religious, but they are living out of wedlock, they are living without marriage. Should I advise them, should I encourage them to keep the laws of family purity? Now, this is a difficult question. On one hand, I'm helping them spiritually because I'm downgrading the, transi the, uh, the transgression from a chiyaf kares to a negative commandment. On the other hand, am I legitimating improper behavior? I should give them a stamp of approval. I should show them how to sin by making the sin less. So like, what, what do you do? This is machlokas. I mean, some, some would say, I should encourage them. Others say, hey, if they're sinning and they're not going to do a tshuva on this, then let them go as far as they go. I will tell you, I have a shtickle raya that it's mutter to kind of downgrade the trans transgression. Uh, from a story involving Rabbi Saul Salanter, Rabbi Saul Salanter spent many, many years wandering through various towns of France and, Italy, uh, France and Germany in order to be Makarev people. His family was in Lithuania, Vilna, but he went around. And in one of his uh, journeys, he was in Königsberg, which was a major port city on the North Sea in Germany. And the longshoremen of Königsberg were all Jewish. Unusual choice of profession. Uh, we don't associate Jews with uh, longshoremen, but they were the longshoremen. And the busiest day of a dock was Shabbos. So all of the longshoremen were Mechalel Shabbos. And this was their Parnassa. They were not religious. Rabbi Sosalander couldn't have just told them, don't work on Shabbos. So he spent hours and hours teaching them how to do the Malachos with the Shinoi, which would make it only an Isr Drabanan. So he felt that even if they're going to transgress, if I could convert an Isr Diorisa to an Isr Drabanan, it would be a worthwhile thing to do. Now, the case of Nida is not exactly the same because there I'm not going from a Doraisa to a Drabanan. I'm going from a Chiv Kares to a simple negative commandment, but there may be some, uh, some analogy. Now, that's Lagabe, the laws of Nida. Now, with respect to a Goy, so the question becomes, um, is a, a premarital relations preferable to being with a Goy? So the, the answer is like this. If the woman happens not to be a nida, for sure pre premarital relations with a Jewish woman is better than being with a guy, because one is a losasa and being with a guy is a much more chamor uh, iser. But if we assume, as is normally the case, normally the case, that the woman I would, uh, the woman that you'd be with as a Jew is a nida as well, then here we have a very interesting issue where technical halacha may conflict with the ultimate values of Judaism. Because if you simply looked at the hierarchy of punishment, the punishment for being with a nida is more chamor than the punishment for being with a goy. The punishment of nida is a chi of kares. Being with a goy may lav dafka be a chi of kares, at least the oraisa. So if I were to simply analyze things in terms of punishment, I would actually say, better to be with a goy than to be with a nida. However, I know that there's a psaac from Yaakov Kamenetsky who said a very interesting thing, and it's, it's really, it takes a gadol to t kind of make these types of decisions, that this is not a matter only of punishment. This is a matter of betrayal of your basic identity as a Jew. And he said that when you have relations with a non-Jew, you are, in a sense, rejecting, at least for that time, you are rejecting your Jewish identity, your Jewish affiliation. You are siding with the enemy. You are going over to Hamas, whatever, however you want to describe it. 
And he said that that is always going to be, whatever the punishment of God is, it's always going to be a worse thing than violating the Torah. Better to violate the Torah as a Jew than to engage in behavior, which is a rejection of being a Jew. And therefore he felt it was a Dover Pashat, that what you might call the ultimate value of Judaism is better to be with a Jew be Avera than to be with a Goy. Uh, this is what, what is sometimes termed meta-halacha analysis that's only given over to Gedolim, in which you look at the ultimate values of Judaism, and that may override the technicalities of which is more chamer. Let me give you another analogy of this, which is a totally different field. People ask the question, let's assume that you're starving, right? you're lost, and you were with a group and one of the people have died. So you have no kosher food. So the question is, is it better to eat treif food, a squirrel, a rodent or something, or is it better to have cannibalism? I don't mean kill a human, that's for sure not, but the, the person's dead. Eat human flesh. So interestingly enough, from the hierarchy of Onshim, eating treif carries a bigger punishment than eating human flesh. Uh, eating human flesh, there are some opinions that say it's only an Isser de Rabbanan, so, right? So there's no clear Isser of eating human flesh. Eating Chazer is an Isser de Arisa. So if I have a choice between being over a de Rabbanan or being over a de Arisa, I certainly, for Pikuach Nevesh, I certainly should choose the de Rabbanan. So some people say, hey, better to be a cannibal. I, again, I don't mean killing somebody, but if he's already dead, better to eat human flesh than to eat Chazer. And again, from a strict standpoint of pure halacha, that's exactly the answer. And yet, and yet, um, there are some gedolei achronim that have said that eating human flesh is, again, it's not a betrayal of being a Jew per se, but it's a betrayal of being a human being. It is such a violation of the sanctity of Selim Elohim that it would override any other consideration. And therefore, any Isser of the Torah would be preferable to that. So that, once again, we would call it a meta halacha analysis, which you have to look at the ultimate values of the Torah. And that might sometimes override the formalistic uh, halachic uh, structure. So those are two examples of, of that question. Uh, yeah? A lot of people, um, I feel like these days, um, want to come closer to religion and become more religious. But at the same time, they have rational heads and they know that as people you don't know everything and we're not so smart we don't really understand our world so much and in the Torah you have to believe in order to be a following Jew I understand that you have to believe in at least the 13 Ikrim of Amuna. and my question is I guess as a rational person who obviously always in the back of my head I have doubts and say you know could be this is true, could be this is not true. I really, I'm not smart enough to really know if it's true. Is there a way to still be a good Jew and still have a rational approach to that? Yeah, so the question becomes that uh, there are people, many, may, may, maybe many people, who, you know, they're not uh, totally convinced at a 100% level that uh, the Ikre Amuna, the foundations are, are true. They're skeptical, they hear arguments. They're not hostile necessarily, but they say, well, you know, maybe yeah, maybe no. Uh, the question is, can, can a person still be a good Jew even if they're on a certain level of, of uh, skepticism and, and the like? I, I think the answer is yes, and, and let, me, let, me, let me explain why. You know, Judaism is both a rational system and a faith-based system, and both things exist at the same time. Meaning, Judaism is a logical structure. It makes sense. It is not asking you to believe things that are nonsensical. But at the same time, it is also not a system that can be proven to a 100% level of mathematical certainty. And at the end of the day, there's going to be a certain leap of faith that's involved. In fact, it's a really a disservice to Torah. I mean, sometimes speakers say, um, I will prove to you that the Torah came from God at a 100% level of certainty. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to prejudge anybody's presentation, but usually 
that's setting up a certain bar which is almost impossible to reach. So if the guy only did it 98%, <laughs> I'm going to oh, yeah, oh, he didn't prove his case. And the point to keep in mind is that just as you said, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand and we never have certainty. And yet, if you think about our life decisions, all of the major decisions in our lives, in fact, all of the minor decisions in our lives, are made on the basis of reasonable probabilities and not on the basis of certainty. A very simple point. Uh, when you decide to cross the street and there are cars, and whether there's a red light or a walk light or whatever it is, you have no guarantee the car is going to stop. And in fact, in Israel, there may be some significant risks. The cars will not stop, both, God forbid, because of uh, the terrorism and, and, the, and the way Israelis drive generally uh, and, and, and the like. But you do, right? So you're, you're taking your life in your hands every time you cross the street. But you make a judgment that it'll probably be okay. You go on a bus, you drive a car, you go on an airplane. You never know. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you swing your leg over your bed, you don't always look at the ground and see if there's solid ground there. You know, maybe uh, everything collapsed and you're on top of a, of a, of a pillar and you know, you're gonna fall down 300 feet. Uh, you don't always look. Uh, who you marry, who knows? the job you're gonna take, the school you're going to go to. So your response is gonna be, well listen, a person has to live, a person has to go on, so obviously I gotta go with the best information that I have and use my head and use my judgment. Now somehow when it comes to serving God, all of a sudden we say, hmm, I don't have enough proof for that. Well, keep in mind that there's no such thing as being undecided because if you decide not to f practice Judaism, you're making a decision. So here's the thing. Let's assume that the case for Judaism is 55% for and 45% not, okay? So what am I supposed to say? Well, you've only proven your case 55%, therefore I'm gonna go with 45%. That makes no sense at all. Uh, you know, you go with what is most likely, no matter what it is. I mean, right? I mean, that, 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 that makes sense. Why, why should I follow a minority position? Because the majority position hasn't been established with a big enough majority. So I think the claim we make for Torah, the claim we make for Judaism, is it is a reasonable system that is more likely than not to be emis. Now, some people aren't convinced of that. That's another schmooze. But if a person believes in the logic of the system, then I think making a commitment to Judaism makes sense. Now, let me point out that there is also something uh, of a spiritual momentum here, and that is there is knowledge of the head and knowledge of the heart. And that is, once I commit myself to a system, even if initially I'm skeptical, but I believe overall it's a logical system, it's a good system, Hashem over time, causes us to feel in our heart that this is emes, this, this is true. And you might call that intuition, but, what, uh, but, uh, but it's really the neshama feeling the truth. And here too, knowledge of the heart is very powerful, and it's not always a linear, syllogistic type of thinking. For example, a choice of a marriage partner is very much the same thing. You can't always articulate in a, you know, a list of pros and cons why I want to marry this person. But you feel that it's the right thing. Now, sometimes people have that feeling even before they become actively from. Other times it comes later. But at some point, a person moves from skepticism to a greater level of certainty, not necessarily because the arguments got better, but because the mitzvos have their own momentum. This is what Chazal mean when they say, mitzvah gereris mitzvah. You know, one mitzvah causes another mitzvah. So I would say this, I would say that nobody's telling you to become from when it makes no sense to you at all, but once it sounds reasonably sensible, there is going to be a leap of faith that can take you to very, very good places and give you very, very deep commitments over, over time. So by all means, a person can be a good Jew, even if they have a certain measure of uncertainty, and hopefully that uncertainty will diminish. Uh, in, in time. Now, from my own personal perspective, and I, I, I would say this, I, I mean, um, obviously, 
you know, in, in teaching people about Judaism and learning about Judaism, we do have to explore, you know, how do you know there's God and how do you know God gave the Torah at Sinai and how do you know the oral law was not made up? And, you know, these are questions that are important questions. They have to be addressed. But it's my gut feeling from, and also from my experience that ultimately what makes people religious, what makes people committed is not answers to philosophical questions but it's because they sense, their neshamo sense, there is something good here. They sense community, they sense warmth, they sense achtos. They sense being connected to something greater than themselves. In many, many ways, philosophical answers keep people in Judaism. They don't necessarily make people religious Jews. Meaning, if I'm a religious Jew and I need to understand, does any of this make sense? So then the philosophical answers can reassure me that we're dealing with a sensible system. Uh, but what makes a person a Jew is actually their connection to a Jewish community or to a Jewish individual that just gives them a feeling of warmth and connection and a, 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 a spiritual feeling. That's the old adage in the, in the Kirov movement that the Rebetzin's Cholent makes more Balei Tshuva than the rabbi's drasha assuming the Rebetzin makes a good, uh, good sholent. So that's why I'm a little, uh, I have a little bit of what you might almost call an anti-intellectual bias in Kirov, because I think it's the warmth that makes a much bigger difference, ultimately, than even the specific answers. Yeah. I was once on a LL flight and at a minion, uh, the chakras, and the, guy, the person leading the service was Sparty. So there was a question whether or not that's enough to go ahead and do it. That's the first question. And then the second question is, if you are allowed to, is that if all you need is a Sephardi guy leading the service in his nusach, are you allowed to do it on a plane? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so these are two questions. Uh, first, let me just give a little background about duchening, uh, the Birkas Kohanim. Uh, as you know, uh, there is in Chutzlar, it's outside of Eretz Yisrael, uh, there's a big, big machlokas, among Ashkenazim and most Svardic uh, Kehilos, Ashkenazim generally do not recite Birkas Kohanim except in the Musaf of the Yom Tov Davening. You might remember this from your prior lives. Uh, Svardim in Chutz La'aretz, Duchen every day. Here in Eretz Yisrael, at least around Yerushalayim, uh, we do have the practice from the Gra, from the Gra, that Ashkenazim say Birkas Kohanim every single day. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, the Vilna Gaon wanted to do this even in Chutz La'aretz, because after all, what's going on here? Birkas Kohanim is a mitzvah in the Torah. Uh, the Torah does not say it's only on Shabbos or only on Yom Tif. So what is the basis of not doing it except on Yom Tif? The Ramah does record such a minak, and the Ramah himself, you get the sense, was a little perplexed as to why there was such a minak, and he gives a strange reason. He says, oh, you know, Birkas Kohanim, the Kohen has to be with Simcha because only a Kohen with Simcha can, can give you a bracha. And in Chutz Laaretz, we're all grouchy. Even on Shabbos, we're grouchy. Except on Yom Tif, we have a shtickle Simcha. So that's why the Kohen only does on Yom Tif. Now, this is a, a weak reason because in reality, it's too subjective. I mean, there are people who are grouchy even on Yom Tif. What if they have a Kohen who's a little bit of a misanthrope, you know? <laughs> now, now, if a Kohen actually hates somebody, he actually shouldn't do it. But let's assume he doesn't hate anybody, but he just, you know, he's a grouchy guy. So what? Uh, so he shouldn't do it on Yom Tif? And Le'idach Gisa, there are people who are happy even during the week. What are you, I mean, you're making this absolute judgment that everybody is not besimcha except on Yom Tif. So because of this, the Gra maintained that this was a weak reason, and he wanted to be miyaset, birkas kayanim, even during the week in Vilna. Now, remember this about the Gra. Uh, forgive me for digressing. The Gra was not the Rav of Vilna. The Gra had no official position in Vilna whatsoever. And the minhagim of the Gra were not the minhagim of the Kehila of Vilna. In the great synagogue of Vilna, which was the main shul, uh, they didn't follow the minhagim of the Gra. And the Gra had to have special permission from the Kehila to have a breakaway minion, this is the Kloi, called the Kloi's of the Gra that was there until the Holocaust, 
in which a small group of people davened with him and they did his, his things. It happened to be the cloys of the Grah was located in the courtyard of the great synagogue. It was next to it, but it was like a separate little building. And you couldn't just go, uh, I want to dive with the Vilna Gaon. I mean, it was, it was by invitation only, more, more or less. And the Gra was given permission, he had to get permission, that he could do his minhagim. It is brought down, though, that he never got to do duchen during the week. Every time he wanted to do duchen during the week, there was a fire in his show, and there was like a simon min hashamayim that he wasn't supposed to do it. Okay. In Eretz Yisrael, the Talmidi Agra followed their Rebbe's minhag, which was kind of easier here because Sephardim were already doing it, and therefore, in a sense, it wasn't. Now, up north in Sfat and Tiveria, we have this problem with JLE sometimes, they do not duchen. Many kids do not duchen every day, uh, and that is because the garin, the seed of the settlements up north, were the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tov, not the Talmidim of the Gra, and they didn't have the minig. Although in Sfat, they have an unusual custom that's unknown in Chutz Laaretz, they only duchen Musaf of Shabbos and Yom Tif. Now, that's an unknown minhag otherwise, because the minhagim are either every day or only on Yom Tif, right? Shabbos, only on Shabbos is, is an unusual, okay, but be it as it may. So the question becomes, the question becomes, um, so if I'm an Ashkenazi, let's take the simple case, if I'm an Ashkenazi and I'm davening in a Sephardi minyan, then for sure, if I'm a Kohen, I'm allowed to do it. That's not even a Shaila. I follow the Minhagim of the Minyan. The other way around, if a Svardi is davening in an Ashkenazi Minyan, he should not do it. Okay, so all of that is, is clear. Now, your particular question, putting aside the airplane uh, thing, is, okay, what if we have a Svardi Chazan who's davening in what is otherwise an Ashkenazi Minyan, uh, should there be duchening? Uh, I think the Pashtus is no, uh, simply because it is not a Sephardi minyan, it is an Ashkenazi minyan. The identity of the Chazan, I mean, even in terms of Nusach, did he daven Nusach Sephardi? Yeah, he daven his, the Sephardi Nusach. Uh, that, it, it, in reality, that's not so Pashtun either. Now, some might say, I'm thinking out loud, some might say that since this is not a regular minyan, this is an ad hoc minyan, so the people could agree that the chazan will be koveya the minhagim. Meaning, if it would have been an Ashkenazi show, right, the Svardi shows up to the young Israel of, of, of whatever it is, uh, he would not be allowed to duchen, even if he's uh, the chazan. Or certainly we wouldn't duchen because he's a chazan. On the other hand, some say if you have ad hoc minyanim, like in the work or whatever it is, they say the chazan will be koveya, the davening. There is such a svara. In fact, in Eretz Yisrael, they do it a lot. Ashkenazi, Sephardi, they, they, they agree. Whoever is the chazan will determine the nusach of the prayer. It's actually better not to do that. It's better to follow the majority, but there would be a makam to allow it. Now, uh, your second question uh, is duchening permitted on an airplane? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I can't automatically come up with a reason why not. Uh, if you're having Kriya Satora on a plane, if you're having Chazara Sashatz on a plane, uh, why not have Duchening? On the other hand, let me point out that Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach was against airplane minyanim at all because he said, number one, you don't hear, uh, that Sibur does not hear the Chazan, and number two, there's a Chilul Hashem, depending on where you're situated, in blocking access to the restrooms and uh, the uh, food service, whatever it would be. So it could be, according to him, if you're not supposed to have the minion, then you wouldn't have Birkas Kohen and him either. But other than that, if you're having Kedusha and Kaddish and, and the like, I think you'd be allowed to have Birkas Kohen and him. But generally speaking, uh, if the majority of the minion are Ashkenazim, it would seem that the best practice is not to do it. Yeah. Um, just on that, I, I, I heard a halakha, I have a, something to do with I heard a halakha that if you're going on the way to Yerushalayim or to Israel from plane from America, then you go with Minhagim of Israel. So what would yep. that be? Yeah, that's, that, that, that is a very interesting point. Uh, that the question becomes, when are you permitted to take on right. the Minhagim of Eretz Yisrael, which would be a new wrinkle. If you say, if you're on the way to Eretz Yisrael, you can already be Makabal those Minhagim, then even if it's an all, Ash all Ashkenazi <laughs> minion, you'd be allowed to do him. 
It's not, it's not so clear, though. I mean, I, I, I think that's what I the case once you're in the airspace <laughs> of, right. of Eretz Yisrael, like the last, uh, you know, hour, last 45 minutes. Uh, whether you can do that when you're over the, uh, the Atlantic, uh, it's less clear. But you, you actually heard such a psak that I you could take on the Minhagim, you were told that. So I, I was on a plane and we weren't saying the same Talamata yet in America, and I got mm -hmm. on the plane and we started saying it in... Uh, and and a, po a Posek to told you that there so was a... It wasn't Posek, it was not really, but... Was okay, like, okay. That's really how... That's a shtick of I'll, I'll look into it. I, I, I wouldn't have said that, but, but I'll look into it. I mean, I, I hear the possible spoiler for it. I also yeah. just wanted to ask a question before that. Yeah. Um, I was reading, this week, I was reading something about the Aldos and... and um, in the Tzrayim, and how Paro told them to um, abort the, all babies at some point, and they didn't listen, even though it says in the Mount Lewis, even though technically abortion isn't considered murder, but through the Jewish perspective. So I, I just um, I just, just want to hear what Rebbe has to say about that. If it, that like, like, what is the Jewish approach to abortion? Like, yeah, yeah. So very quickly, this, this is uh, the Jewish approach towards abortion. Um, you know, it's interesting that in the secular world, we divide people into people who are called pro-choice, who believe that every woman has the absolute right to abort, at least up to a certain age, and pro-life that says abortion is murder. The Catholic Church's position is aborting a fetus at, uh, after conception is murder mamish. Now, what is the Jewish, pers uh, the Jewish perspective? So in reality, it's kind of in between. Uh, Judaism absolutely prohibits abortion unless you have a very, very strong reason. Now, what is the strong reason? Many, many shitos. Some say only if the mother's life is in danger. Others say for sickness. Uh, there, may be, there may be reasons, but abortion is usher. But what's interesting is abortion does not seem to be ritzicha. It does not seem to be murder. And the proof of that is, if I kill a human being, I'm chay of misa. I could be executed by a basin. Abortion is not a capital crime. Right? One who kills a fetus, even if they were given warning and everything else, is not executed by a basin. Under the Noahide laws, for a guy, it is a capital crime, not for a Jew. So the question becomes, how do you understand their vada is an issue of abortion. No, no, please do not misunderstand me at all. We have to be 100% borer. There's an issue of abortion. But how do you understand the issue of abortion if you're not chay of misa for killing the fetus? I'm going to give you a number of possibilities that you see in the Rishonim and Achreinim. Possibility number one is, which seems not to be what the Miam Loe says, it is murder, but it's a Gezeira Sakasov, you don't get capital punishment for it. In other words, it's non-capital punishment murder, but in terms of the Iser, it is Ritzich HaMamesh. That's one view that's very, very Chamor. There is another view that it's not Ritzich, but it is the destruction of a potential life. In other words, Ritzich is the destruction of life. Abortion is not murder because the fetus is not an actual autonomous life, but it's the frustration of potential. And the Chavos Yoyer says it is similar to the wasting of seed. Right? The wasting of seed is also not murder, but it's destroying a potentiality. And therefore the Chavos Yoyer actually says abortion is hashchasas zera. There is a third view that says abortion is simply chavala, right? You're not allowed to wound yourself. You're not allowed to cut, or cut off your hand or whatever it would be. Abortion is chavala. Now, you understand that that would actually be very makal if the woman has any health reason at all. Chavala is mucha, right? And there's a fourth shita, which is a das yachid ma'ot, one line in Tosfos and Masechus Nida, that says abortion may, might only be an isra de Rabbanan. That's a, a das yachid mamish, but there is one sheet in Taisvis that uh, abortion. So, so we, ha we have a whole range of possibilities. Either it's murder without capital punishment, or it's an isra de Rabbanan, or we have things in between, hashchas or 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 chavala. So uh, the point is, that Judaism is not pro-choice. That's the most we can say. So we don't accept necessarily, necessarily the position of the Catholic Church 
that it is murder, but we also don't accept uh, the unlimited right to have an abortion for whatever it is. Now, I'm going to mention something else. I'm, again, this may open me up to hate mail. And uh, that is, and I'm just throwing this out. I'm not, I'm not giving you my belief on it at all. And that is, one might make the interesting argument that even though I, as a religious Jew, believe abortion is generally going to be usser, I might not necessarily want there to be restrictive abortion laws. Now, you know, for many, many years in the United States, we had this case, Roe versus Wade, which more or less legitimated abortions at almost all stages until the very end of the pregnancy. Uh, but just, uh, was it two years ago, whatever it is, the Trump Supreme Court, very surprisingly actually, reversed Roe versus Wade. And now what that means is every state is free to prohibit or restrict abortions. Now, some liberal states are not going to do it anyway. Right? California will keep its abortion law. New York will keep its abortion law in spite of Orthodox Jews. Uh, Massachusetts will certainly keep its abortion laws. But in more conservative southern states like Texas, Florida, all of these states, they are making abortion restrictions. So here's the question. I'm a religious Jew. I live in Texas. So when there was Roe versus Wade, abortion was mutter. Roe versus Wade is butto, and now we have a chance to usher abortion. Should I, as a religious Jew, be in favor of the secular government ushering abortions? Or maybe I should say no. So let me explain the two ideas. One svara is, well, listen, if abortion is something that's forbidden, even for Gentiles, even for Gentiles under the seven laws of Noah, when the government is moving towards greater compliance with the Noahide laws, that's a good thing. So I should push for restrictive abortion laws because that is the Ratzon Hashem, not just for Jews. That's the Ratzon Hashem for God. That, I think, is the Pashat Pshat, and I think most people would say it like that. But there's another svara like this. Let's imagine... Texas passes a law, I'm just making it up, that says abortion is only permitted if the mother's life is in danger. So I look at that law and I say, hey, that's good. That's what halacha says. But wait a second. Who decides if the mother's life is in danger? Is it going to be the Rav or is it going to be the state's attorney in whatever county in Texas? Meaning once you make it a secular law, the determination of pikuach nefesh is going to be up to a secular authority who might disagree with the psak of a rav. So in a sense, if you think about it, when the state allows abortion, that's actually better for Orthodox Jews because then Orthodox Jews simply have to talk to their posek and their posek will say yes or no and there'll be no interference. So you get into a funny thing. In terms of society as a whole, a, a restrictive abortion law is better for society as a whole because it cuts down abortions. But for me as a religious Jew, I do better with a pro-choice law than I do with a pro-life law because a pro-choice maximizes my ability to follow halacha with no interference. So do I do what's better for the from Jew or what's better for society as a whole? You see, this is a paradox. A from Jew, as a from Jew, does better with pro-choice. Because pro-choice just simply says, I can make my decisions without government interference. However, for society, that's a bad thing from my perspective, because that allows them to violate halachos much more than would otherwise be the case. So I'm not, uh, again, I'm not taking any position on this. It's just something you think about that. It's fascinating that you can be absolutely against abortion and not necessarily in favor of restrictive abortion laws. Yeah? Are there any um, sources in the Torah that show about healthy eating and exercise? Well, uh, are there any sources in the Torah that talk about healthy eating and exercise? So, so here's the thing. Uh, the Torah does not tell you what is healthy food, what is not healthy food. Uh, the Torah does give us a commandment. You shall guard your soul. Now, there is a machlokas how to interpret that pasuk. Some say that's referring to spiritual uh, preservation and remembering Matan Torah. So some say it's nothing to do with health. 
But the Rambam disagrees. The Rambam actually says that this is a pasuk that obligates a Jew to take care of their physical health. And the Rambam, of course, was a great doctor. Uh, and the Rambam in Hilchos Deos, in the Mishnah Torah, has two chapters devoted largely to diet and to a lesser, lesser degree to even exercise. And uh, the Rambam makes the following interesting point. The Rambam says that a healthy body is a means of how I serve Hashem, how I learn Torah and the like, and therefore I am mechiev to preserve my body, not because health itself is an end, but it is a means. In fact, the Rambam makes an interesting point. In, per in the introduction to Perkei Yavas, the Rambam says that a person who is addicted to health and exercise as ends in themselves is no better than a glutton that's addicted to food. They just have different addictions. Now, as we tend to think, oh, the guy that's addicted to food is a disgusting person, but the guy that jogs and lifts weights you know, six hours a day, that's a good person. The Rambam says no. One is no better than the other person. He says, uh, one person is addicted to food and one person is addicted to health. The Rambam says, a health addiction is just as bad. But, the Rambam says, the value of taking care of your health is not because there's some intrinsic value to the healthy body, but because it is a means to be able to serve Hashem. So because of this, the Rambam says, it is extremely important. And again, I mean... Uh, I mean, I'm guilty, many, you know, many people are unfortunately guilty of this. We need to be more aware of it, that taking care of our health is a very, very, very important uh, thing. That is the way we can serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hopefully, of course, Arichas Yamim, I mean, there are people who are really, really healthy, who die young. You see this all the time, these athletes that, in fact, for some reason, I'm hearing more and more about it. I'm not sure if it's become more prevalent of people dying suddenly in their 30s or whatever. But B'dera Chateva, you take care of your health, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you uh, more arichas yamim. So it actually is an issue that we need to be more concerned about. You know, we have uh, Tu B'Shvat coming up, and uh, even Or Sameach makes a Tu B'Shvat Seder for the Mechina. So uh, my little joke is that they want guys to have a healthy diet at least one day a year, where all the fruits, all the fruits and vegetables uh, that you eat on, on uh, Tu B'Shvat. So it's something we, need to be, we, do, we do need to be aware of. You know, um, one of the great Gaonim, who was a Rosh Hashiva in Or Sameach, as well as having his own yeshiva, was Rav Dov Schwartzman. Maybe you heard of him. Uh, his picture is in the, the office. Uh, Rav Kanik uh, was a Talmud Muvaka Rav Dov Schwartzman when Rav Dov Schwartzman was here. And uh, Rav Dov Schwartzman had a very, in when he was a younger person, maybe a Bachar, he had a very interesting learning schedule. He would learn like 30 hours without sleeping. Uh, he would then go on a 50-mile bicycle hike and then sleep for like uh, 20 hours. So you see that he combined this extreme learning with some very good, vigorous physical exercise and then you know, caught up on his sleep. And I'm not saying that's a schedule for everybody. It probably isn't. Uh, but you see that there was a hakpada to take care of his health uh, in, that, uh, in that way. So it is uh, an agenda item that we need to be aware of. Yeah. What exactly are kavanos, as usually mentioned within the framework of Kabbalah, and why do most people not employ them these days? Or do we? If not, should we? Yeah, the term kavanos, so, uh, uh, which is a, used in Kabbalah, so let me explain. Once again, uh, kavanos is a generic term, but it also has a specific meaning. Generically, kavana just means direction, Focus, and that simply means when we say daven with kavana, that means think about what you're saying, and don't just daven it up. <laughs> it's really a chaval. When we talk about doing something superficially, when I say when we say you know bikias isn't so good because you're just learning superficially. So what's the language? Look at the language we use. It says don't daven it up. That's kind of sad that when we want to describe something as superficial done without thinking, we call it davening, <laughs> which means we're so connected to that's what our davening is, we now use it as a phrase for anything else that you do superficially. Kavana is the opposite. So that's generic kavana. That simply means know what you're saying, think about what you're saying, focus on what you're saying. In fact, lechaven really means to focus. 
Now, in Kabbalah, particularly in the Arizal, Kavana acquired a more specific meaning, and that is uh, the Kavanos are very, very specific things that you think about at certain points of the prayer, which are primarily, we actually talked about this earlier today, primarily con uh, con uh, connected to unification of different spheros, to bring out very specific spiritual energies. Uh, so I mentioned this morning, l'shem yichud kutsha berichu u'shechintei, the unification of Kutsha Baruchu, which are the six Sviros, and the Shechina, which is Malchus. And the Arizal made it very, very specific that this bracha has this unification, and that bracha has this unification. And in combination, and that's why if you ever look at a Kabbalistic Siddur, I mean, you could find such thing. we even have them here in Or Sameach in different nooks and crannies, you will see like pages and pages, like in the first bracha of Shmon Esher, there'll be ten pages of things to think about, etc. And these are called kavanas, and often there's a synonym called yichudim. Yichudim are unifications. Kavanas for yichudim are more or less synonymous. And they are very, very specific. And uh, if the question is, why don't we, whoever the we is, do it, uh, the answer is because most of us would have no idea what it means. We just don't know what it means. The kavanos are people are for people who are on a very, very high level of Kabbalistic understanding. And there are makubalim that do it. Um, in fact, there was a great makubal, the Rashash. Now don't confuse them with the Litvash Rashash. There is a Rashash that's a well-known Perush on Gemara, Rav Shmuel Strashan, the Rashash, and he's in the back of every Gemara, every Vilna Gemara. Uh, but this is a different Rishash. This is Rav Sholom Sharabi, who is a great, 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 great Makubal. And he especially, uh, he took the Kavanas of the Ari and he elaborated on them. And uh, if you find a Siddur HaRishash, you will see you know, pages and pages and pages and pages. And that's why a Kabbalistic Shemona Esrei might take three, four hours. It might take that long if you really go through all of the Kavanas. So, you know, we don't do that. And I'll tell you another story, though, about, about uh, the Kavanas of the Yari that really brings this out in a very powerful way. There was a Baal Teikea, either for the Bredichever or for the Baal Shem Tov. They, they have two different versions of the story. And he wanted to master the Kavanas of the Yari for Tekiya Shofar. That when he would blow the Shofar, he would have all of these Kavanas. And, I mean, it's so detailed. Every Tekiya is a different Kavana. When you blow nine Shvarim, every toot... I'm sorry, nine truths. Every tooth is a different covenant. So he studied and he learned and he learned and he learned and he learned. This is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. And he tried to keep it in his head. And he finally managed to get it down on one sheet of paper to jog his memory that when he's blowing, he looks at the paper, he'll remember all these covenants. Wonderful. But on the day of Rosh Hashanah, he lost his paper. He couldn't find it. And he didn't remember a thing, because once you put it on paper, like, you know, you allow yourself to forget. And, and he didn't remember anything. He was crying as he blew Schaefer, because all he did was he blew Schaefer. No Kabanas. So after Rosh Hashanah, the Baal Shem Tov for the Bredichever said to him, what was your secret this year? Your Tekiah Schaefer was so powerful. In Shamayim, it penetrated all of the walls. It opened up the gates of heaven. But the Baal Shem Tov knew these things. It brought mercy on Am Yisrael. There never was a Tekiah Shaifer I remember that was like this. What was your secret? And the Baal says, I don't know what the Rebbe means. I had no secrets. I had nothing. I brought nothing to the table. I blew Shaifer because I blew Shaifer. He says, I don't know why it was special in any way. And the Baal Shem Tov said the following. In Shemayim, there are many, many chambers of brachas. There's a chamber for the bracha for Parnassa, and a chamber for the bracha of health, and a chamber for the bracha of Shiduchim, and a chamber for the bracha of fertility. And what are kavanot? Kavanos are keys that open up the locks to those chambers. Right? There's a kavana 
for shiduchim, a kavana for, again, I'm not just talking about uh, general kavana, but with the sviros and the different combinations. But the Baal Shem Tov says, or the Berditchever said, what if a person doesn't have his keys? There's one thing that can open up any door, assuming it's a wooden door, even without a key, and that's an axe. And the axe that opens up all doors is the broken heart that you bring to Hashem. So the Baal Shem Tov and the Berditchever told the Baal Tokea, you lost your keys, but you brought an axe. And the axe breaks down every single barrier. And in truth, there's something from the Arizal that's very interesting. The Arizal said himself that the purpose of all of my kavanos, now remember, the Ari himself did not write things. All the kids for the Ari is from Rav Chaim Vital. But Rav Chaim Vital quotes the Arizal as saying, all of my kavanos is to bring me to a place that I cry to Hashem the way a two-year-old cries for his mother. It's very interesting. The kavanas are complicated, intricate, but they're designed to bring us to the simple level of a child wanting to be with his mother. We need maybe that sophistication, but it's designed to bring us back. So people ask, for example, you know, did the Arizal know more than the Tanoim or Amoraim? Uh, did Avram Avinu know Kabbalah? If Avram Avinu didn't know Kabbalah, does that mean the Ari was greater than Avram Avinu? So we, we could discuss this, you know, maybe the Avos did have Kabbalah, you know, but, but I, I think there's a, a powerful point here that maybe they didn't. I'm willing to say they didn't. But they didn't need it. They had a direct relationship with Hashem. They didn't have to reconstruct it by creating complicated pathways because they had the direct connection. When you have the direct connection, see, Kabbalah is trying to rebuild pathways that have been severed. So we've got to do a lot of intricate reconstruction of pathways. But when you have the pathway, you don't necessarily need all of the structure. So it's, it is Yitachin, I believe, that maybe the other Sakitashim did not have full possession of a Kabbalistic structure, but that was not essential for their Avaidah. Yeah? Um, recently, it seems like, unfortunately, a lot of the Chayalim were passing away in this war, the following war, are, are not only killed, but they're passing away in this war. Um, what would you say to the Yeah, the issue is that, unfortunately, uh, Chayolim have, have died in, in larger numbers in recent days. And that's a tragedy no matter who, religious or not religious, but the tragedy is even greater for us because some of them were not just uh, religious, but they were B'nai Torah, they were people who were learning in yeshivas. And uh, they gave up uh, the learning of yeshivas to voluntarily uh, enlist uh, in the army because they wanted to participate in the defense of, of the Jewish people and Eretz Yisrael. Uh, and they died. They gave their lives, uh, really, al Kiddush Hashem in that way. And the question becomes, how come some do that, some make that commitment, and others stay behind? Uh, others don't make that commitment. Others stay where, they, stay where they're staying. You know, um, it's a very hard question to answer. I mean, on one hand, as I mentioned this morning again, uh, we don't look at people, see, we don't look at people who stay in the base medrash as shirkers of their responsibility. We, we, we regard our learning as maybe the most, as the most significant component 
of, of the victory. Uh, where it turns bad is when we disparage chayalim and we don't recognize their sacrifices. That becomes callous. That becomes being an ingrate. That's a lack of hakara sataif. But if we're machshiv with the other, what chayalim are doing, but we recognize that this is our contribution, then you know, that's perfectly valid. Now, why some people say, I'm going to set that aside to fight, that, that's very hard to understand. But all I can say is that people have different tafkidim in life. People have different missions in life. And in many, many ways, in life generally, your neshama is a guide. Right? We talk about intuition. Now, I understand that a person's intuition can be very unreliable. It can throw you off. There can be a lot of distortions. But at the root of things, there is something within my panemius that is directing me where I should go. The Vilna Gaon writes in Mishle that every person has Ruach HaKodesh. We think Ruach HaKodesh only belongs to the greatest tzaddikim. He says, no, you have Ruach HaKodesh, but it gets distorted by conflicting voices. But if you kind of focus, no, Davin, learn to try to get that clarity. There will be something within you that emerges which is Hashem's directive to you. Hashem will direct you. So people have different tafkidim. There are tafkidim in Klal Yisrael where my job is to fight physically and risk my life. There are tafkidim in Klal Yisrael where my job is to be in the base Medrash. So it's a bit of a mystery that determines why some people have this tafkid and some people don't. But it's very important that we don't kind of relegate, God forbid, the people in the base Medrash as being abdicators of responsibility, um, because they're not. Uh, this is a great, great fulfillment of that responsibility. Yeah. Um, it's really a three-part question. Where does trap when reading from a Torah come from? Why are there different traps for Torah, different for specific Megillahs? Um, and then does it hold any meaning to the word itself? When you do it. Yep, so trap, which is Yiddish, uh, in Hebrew they're called ta'amim, or ta'amei hamikra, the musical notation uh, for Tanakh, and we have the trap of the Torah, the trap of Nevi'im and Kesuvim, and then we have special trap for the five Megillos, and special trap for three works of the Kesuvim, Eov, Mishle, Tehillim. They're called Sifrei Emes. Right? Uh, that's a different trap than actually uh, the other books of the Ksuvim. Although we don't read those books publicly, but, but nevertheless there is a trap for them. So according to the Gemara Nadarim, this is part of the Halachal of Moshe Misina. When Hashem gave Moshe the text of the Torah, He also gave him, the just like He gave him vowels, nekudos, He gave him Tameh HaMikra. So Tamim are part of Halachal Moshe Misinai. But I tell you, there's a real problem. What does that mean? Let, let me explain this. Let's take Nekudos, which is easier to deal with. What do we mean that vowel? Remember, Hebrew as a written language is a consonantal language. It only has consonants. It doesn't have vowels. Right? Vowels are supplied by vowels, by the Nekudos. Now, when we say the Nekudais were given by Hashem to Moshe, we don't mean the pictorial representation of the Kamatz as a T and the Patach as a line. That's convention. In fact, there were other systems of writing vowels. In fact, there were systems of writing vowels that were above the word instead of under the word. So we don't mean the particular picture of vowels was given by Moshe. That's man-made. We simply mean pronunciation, meaning when we say vowels were given to Moshe, we mean God told Moshe how words should be pronounced. Mimela, how you memorialize that in writing, that's a human function. Okay? So that is clearly how we understand the vowels were given to Moshe Bessinai. I got that. So when we come to the trup, we have a real problem. Once again, the trap has pictorial, right? There are pictorial signs. But that wasn't given to Moshe. That's man-made. That's just, right? So what are you going to tell me? So we don't mean the pictures of the notes, but we mean the musical notation. But that's a problem. Because Ashkenazim sing differently than Svardim. 
and Taimanim are different. You see? So what was given? In other words, what is, what is left? I mean, that's really the problem. Me meaning to say, if the pictures of the notes were not given to Moshe Messina, and the singing of the notes were not given to Moshe Messina, so what is left of the trup that was given to Moshe Messina? See, in the case of vowels, the pronunciation was given to Moshe Messina. So the answer is that, this is an interesting point, the real purpose of trup is not the music. It is the punctuation of the sentence in subtle ways that we don't always understand. Meaning the trup is the punctuation of a pusik. Now, clearly we see this in some of the trup. For example, sof pasuk is an indicator this is the end of the sentence. Esnachta, which is the wishbone, that's the semicolon that divide, right? So here is the thing that's a little more subtle. Every single tam is indicating how a word should be emphasized. It's indicating milel o milra. Uh, it's indicating whether it's a major stop or a minor stop. The music is simply the way that you express the punctuation. So in theory, even without the music, a person who knew Trump very well would know how to read the Pusik with punctuation. So it could very well be that even the music is not connected to Moshe Misenai. It's the punctuation of the verse. You see what I'm saying? Now, in that sense, therefore, Trump is actually a very important interpretive key in how to read a Pusik. Now, you get into problems because Chazal's interpretation of a pasuk is not always consistent with the punctuation. Now, this Chazal may have drushes on the pasuk that are kind of combining elements that the trup separates, and you know that's a good question. That's part of Torah Shabal Peh that allows a deviation from it. But the essential role of trup is not music. The essential role of trup is punctuation. And this is kind of a lost art. I mean, uh, it's a lost art because when we teach kids bar mitzvah, we teach them how to sing, meaning how do you sing the note. We don't really emphasize how this is a punctuation mechanism. But trup is about punctuation much more than it is about music. And that's why Ashkenazim, Sephardim could sing it differently. But in terms of the punctuation, they're following the same punctuation rules in terms of major break, minor break. Uh, joining the phrases, separating the phrases, that's going to be the same across the board because that is halacha l'moshe misinai. Okay? Yeah. Um, so I read in the Yochud Yosef uh, a few days ago that someone who was born on Shabbos will inevitably die on Shabbos. And the reason that was given was because they made people break Shabbos to save their <laughs> life when they were born. Yeah. And that way they're going to die on Shabbos. But oh, that, yeah, that yeah. just gets me thinking, well, aren't they going to have to like also break Shabbos? Because if you're dead in the hospital, or they're going to have to like pull the plugs, or your family's going to have to be there. Like, what, like I'm, I think that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that the Chassam Sofer actually says uh, a pregnant woman should pray that she should not give birth on Shabbos in order not to be goreim. Chelol Shabbos. It should actually be a prayer of a person uh, not to give birth on Shabbos. Uh, but of course, uh, the statement that if you're born on Shabbos, you die on Shabbos because you caused Chelol Shabbos uh, sounds, sounds a little unfair. I mean, it's not, it's not the baby's fault, you know. The baby just uh, came out that particular time. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that's 100% true either. I mean, if you, if you <laughs> I don't have the records in front of me, but the I'm quote, sure. The quote is yeah. Okay, Yarut Tavash is Rav Yonah Senepshitz. So it's a list. So it's not from Chazal. It's interesting. I have to go back. Yarut Tavash is the great Rav Yonah Senepshitz who lived in the um, 16, 1700s. So Yarut Tavash is his uh, famous Sefer of Drushas. So I'll, I'll try to check that. Uh, but your question that if you die on Shabbos, that also causes Chil of Shabbos, uh, that's not necessarily so. I mean, uh, if you look at, I mean, there are many, many halachos regarding uh, you know, death on Shabbos. And uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't do a levi on Shabbos, meaning the halachic system does not allow violation of Shabbos 
uh, to bury the dead or take care of the dead. Now, in modern like hospitals, in hospital, like the tools and the pulling the plugs. Yeah, the but you know, the assumption would be that uh, at least in Chutzlaris, there would be goyim. You know, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be the chil shabbos of Jews. Mashen Cain for pikuach nefesh. When a woman goes into labor, then even a Jew is supposed to. That's a great Shabbos. Now you see from that, though, it's interesting, from the Yaris Devash, and again, again I, I should check that, Yaris Devash, that even though everything you do for a woman and for the newborn baby is mutter legamri because of pikuach nefesh, right? The husband is allowed to drive her to the hospital, but it's still called a sin. It's an interesting idea that even if something is permitted, it is still considered to be not the greatest thing. It's an interesting concept that even a permissible sin can still be called a sin. Now, I do want to point out that I believe the Rambam would not agree with that because the Rambam's language, when the Rambam describes pikuach nefesh overriding Shabbos, the Rambam's language is that in a case of pikuach nefesh, Shabbos is identical to a day of chol. It is a day of chol. It is a weekday. It's not that you're violating Shabbos, but it's allowed for pikuach nefesh. It's not called a desecration of Shabbos. So I'm not sure if the Rambam would subscribe to that idea. Uh, yeah. Here's another send-in. Chazal say that the Egyptians made the Jews do meaningless work, and the Jews themselves knew that all their work was just to subjugate them. Why then did the Zikanim go to Pharaoh after their straw was taken away, to plead for the Jews to once again be given straw. Didn't they know that the whole idea of them doing work was for no reason? If so, they had no basis to believe that such a request would have, would have any chance of success. Yeah, so the question here involves the idea that one of the ways the Egyptians tormented us was not just by the amount of work they gave us, but by making the work fundamentally meaningless, that we would build structures that would collapse. That's why people sometimes think the pyramids were built by Jews. You know, who knows? But according to Chazal, it would appear that wasn't the case, because Chazal specifically say that the structures the Jewish people built were meant to collapse. Now, maybe, maybe that wasn't everything, but that, that's what Chazal say. And that adds to a person's frustration. They tell the story in the Holocaust about a person that was chained to a wheel and their job was to pull so the wheel would go around and around and around and they thought that grain was being ground on the other side of the, the wall. The wheel was on the other side of a wall uh, and they found out later that there was nothing attached there. It was meaningless and the story goes the person committed suicide simply because there was no meaning or accomplishment in that work and that made it even, even worse. This is the famous Greek story of Sisyphus. The ultimate punishment is he has to push a rock up a mountain and then it just goes down again and again and again. So this was what you might call the psychological warfare of the Egyptians, which was designed not only to crush our bodies, but to crush our spirits in giving us a sense that whatever we're doing is meaningless and stupid and without purpose. So the question was, uh, if you're dealing with that type of, uh, of oppressor, then they're not going to be in a very compassionate mode in terms of asking, uh, remember the Zikanim went and they said, uh, please take away your new gezerah that we have to gather our own, our own straw and still make uh, the, uh, the, the quota of bricks. Uh, if this is supposed to be meaningless work, then why would the Egyptians relent on this? and the like. So I, I think there are two possible answers to this. I mean, one possible answer would be that uh, there is, or at least the Zikana might have thought, there was some residual of compassion even against someone who totally demeans me, meaning to say, at some point, there may be a limit to how cruel they want to be, so there was a thought that maybe we could appeal to their humanity. Well, my said that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work, but at least one could have a havamina that uh, there might be some compassion. The other thing, though, is I think the following. I think you have to re-understand Chazal a little bit. When Chazal said uh, this was meaningless work, I don't think they meant to say that 100% of the work was meaningless. I mean, let's, take the, let's go back to the Holocaust for an example. The Germans did, Jew, did use Jewish war labor 
to produce ammunition and other things for the war effort, meaning Jews were employed in factories to produce things that the Germans, Yimach Shemam, needed. So there was meaningless work, there was demeaning work, there was humiliating work, but then there also was productive work, I mean productive in terms of the German definition, not because the Germans wanted to make us feel productive, but simply because they had certain needs that were met by the slave labor. So I would imagine that even in Mitzrayim, it may have been very much the same. Yeah, there was the aspect of humiliation, but there was also the aspect that the Egyptians did have construction projects and they needed bricks. So at least vis-a-vis -vis that work, the argument's going to be made, we're not going to be able to meet the quotas. In fact, it may not even be a mercy argument. It may be, we cannot make these quotas without your giving us the raw material. And therefore, your needs are going to be compromised. And as my point was, if once you agree that not everything is meaningless and the Egyptians have certain needs, so you could pitch your claim not based on rachamim, you can pitch your, pitch your claim based on the needs that the Egyptians have for those construction projects. So I think that might be a possible answer. Uh, yeah? Um, do you think that there's any like, cue in any way of, I guess, like going down south and visiting, like those places where the tragedies happen? Like, some people were trying to say how, like, some idea to, like, how the Indians are visiting, like, um, the concentration camps and the tragedies that we saw there. And maybe it's also like to going down and seeing the tragedies that also happened down south. Yeah, so the question is about visiting and seeing the tragedies that happened down south, uh, similar to visiting concentration camps. First of all, I think there's a huge, huge difference here. I mean, um, I think the case for visiting down south is a much stronger case than visiting a concentration camp. I visit a concentration camp, which can be very moving and powerful. There are no Jews there. I mean, they're gone and I'm some, simply reliving tragedy. So here you're talking about families that are still suffering, uh, communities that are still there. So when I go down, I'm not just visiting Auschwitz. I am there actively to provide comfort and support. So I don't think you need to use the concentration camp idea to justify uh, trying to visit communities in the South. I think it's a very, very good thing. Now again, um, I'm not addressing the issue of Bittel Torah and how you balance it with other things. That's always going to be a, an issue. Uh, but as a general concept, this is the chesed and the achtus and the, the unity that we show with Jews that are suffering. This is what Chazal call a very important midah. No se be all es chavere. Very important. I share your yoke. I bear your yoke. Your suffering is my suffering. In English, we'll call that empathy, but no se biol is a very important idea. You know, the Rambam says in Hilchas Tshuva, the Rambam discusses certain sins that are so bad that you don't have a share in Olam Haba. If you desecrate Shabbos, you still have a share in Olam You get Gehenim for that, and you go to Olam Haba. But certain Averis are so bad, you don't get Olam Haba. And one of them is called Poresh Midarche Yetzibor one who separates from the congregation. What does that mean? That when they suffer, it doesn't affect me. When they have joy, it doesn't affect me. So says the Rambam, even if you learn Torah, even if you do mitzvahs, even if you're 100% from, if you don't feel the suffering of other Jews, you're a porish midarch etzibor, and chas v'shalom, unless we do tshuva, one could lose their olam haba for that type of feeling. So as I say, I don't, I don't think you have to come on to the concentration camp aspect for this. I think there's a live population that needs chizuk that we should be concerned with. Yeah? We know that when a Gera converts, he formally receives a new neshama. Is there any chance that this, this is a Gilgal neshama or totally a fresh new neshama? Furthermore, we often don't consider the question, where does the old Goyesh neshama go? <laughs> yeah, so the question was, when a person converts, uh, they receive a new neshama. Uh, where does the old neshama go? So first of all, there is actually a machlokas, a very interesting machlokas in Kabbalah. How do we understand the spiritual essence of a convert? Some indeed look at it as a new, when you go to the mikveh, you're under the mikveh, so when you emerge from the mikveh, there's a new spiritual essence that comes into you. That is one, one pshat. There's another pshat 
that a ger was born with a Jewish neshama. It's like a Jewish neshama <coughs> in a non-Jewish body. You didn't get a new neshama. Rather, there is now a correspondence between your body and your neshama. Your neshama is now matched up with your guf to enable your neshama to do the mitzvos that it needs for its tikkun, because the mitzvahs are connected to the guf, right? <laughs> in other words, my Jewish neshama in a non-Jewish body cannot do the mitzvahs, and that creates a lot of agma snefesh. Now, Baruch Hashem, my body matches my neshama. That's why, by the way, a number of gayim, not everybody, so it's hard to empirically prove this, they describe a sense of unease from the time they were young children. I mean, they're, uh, for example, the famous Gertzedek of Vilna, didn't even know any Jews when he was a little kid. But every Shabbos, he felt a great deal of anxiety. He didn't know why. He felt something was wrong, meaning there was something in him. I spoke to somebody today who, he was not a Gary, he was actually a, a, but he was born a Jew, but he was born into a very, very, very secular family, not even reform, uh, ethical culture, which is to the extreme left of the reform movement. So reform would be Haredi reform, and this is like, uh, you know, real, real, real out there. And he mentioned that from the time he was seven years old, he had this chronic anxiety of feeling he was in the wrong place, feeling he didn't belong. Now there, I would say that's the Yiddish and Shama coming out. But the MS is even non-Jews have described it that way. So your question is not a question if you follow the Shita that this is the soul that he always had. Now, but if you learn the other way, and, and people do learn it the other way, that it mamish is a new neshama, so the question is, where does the old neshama go? So that's a hard question. Neshamas are not like uh, trash that are recycled. Essentially, because neshamas are aspects of, of God's breath, so to speak, even non-Jewish neshamas, so it simply gets reabsorbed into the totality of God's infinity, and no longer has a sense of individual identity. It simply goes back to its shorish and just gets reabsorbed into the Mitzvah, Mitzvah Hashem. Okay? Yeah. Um, is there any, should one be concerned if listening to Jewish music in the bathroom about um, sukkim or something being like... Yes, yes, this is very important. Uh, when we're in a bathroom, we're not supposed to... Uh, not only are, aren't we allowed to say Torah, we're not allowed to think about Torah. It's an issue of thinking about Torah. By the way, that's more chamor than sneas. This is an interesting halacha. If I'm facing a woman who's not dressed with sneas, I'm not allowed to say a bracha or say words of Torah, but I am allowed to think words of Torah. That's why if you're on a bus sometimes, maybe you, might, you might not be allowed to actually say things, but you can think Torah. Masha Enkein, the bathroom rules, are stricter. Not only is there an Isser of speaking, there's also an Isser of thinking. In fact, the whole so what do you think about in the bathroom? Uh, so, so, so if it's a purely secular stuff, that's fine, but uh, can you think about Musser, you know, uh, <laughs> exactly, general Musser? Okay, it's an, an interesting question. So according to that, if the music is going to bring out psukim or mamare chazal, you have a real problem because by definition I'm listening to a song that has mamare chazal, so I'm thinking about mamare chazal. So I'm thinking about Torah in the Beis HaKise. So you, you have to be careful. Now, the interesting question is, what if it's just the nigan? What if it's the tune without the words? So then it kind of depends on what, what, what thoughts are triggered in your mind. Meaning, uh, if the tune makes you think of the words, you've got a problem. If the tune doesn't make me think of the words, then it would be permitted. So even if it's a tune that's connected to words of Kedusha, the tune itself would be, would be permitted. So they would say, even if it's a Jewish song, that not necessarily has Sukkim. Okay, so that's, an, so, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Now you, we have now songs, often they're in English, inspirational songs that uh, you know, talk about the eternal Jew, whatever it will be, it tell, tells a nice story, which is a spiritual story, right? a spiritual story, but it's not tied to specific psukim or mamare chazal, but it's about how wonderful it is uh, to be a Jew or, or something, something like that. So that, that's a very interesting question. It seems that actually that is mutter. 
That is mutter. In fact, some say even re reading stories about Gedola might be mutter, if, but that's very difficult. To, if it's not tied directly to a Maimur Chazal or a Pasuk, and this is even more, more so, this is even, uh, so, I, so I think it is mutter in such a situation. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've noticed that some people like to make brachas out loud, and on this topic, I see they do it for Asher Tsar too, which I get a little uncomfortable with, but I don't even know what kind of kid. I mean, is that maybe not so proper, or it's better to, I don't know, Well, uh, yeah, I, I understand uh, you're uneasy a little bit. I'm sure you are, uh, I'm announcing to the world, I just went to the bathroom, like, you know, uh, do I have to be so public about that? Uh, but the answer is, you know, okay, listen, uh, everybody knows that this is what we do. Uh, nothing to be ashamed about. And to praise Hashem and give thanks to Hashem for the smooth functioning of the human body is, is appropriate. So Asher Yatsar, you can also uh, say it out loud and have people answer, answer amen uh, to it. You know, it's interesting that um, I read an article once by a, a from urologist. And uh, he pointed out that, you know, when kids, let's say kids, first learn that you make a bracha for the bathroom, it's a little bit of a joke. They, they joke about it a lot. Oh, you go to the bathroom, you make a bracha. And he said that he treats patients every day who have elimination problems. And he knows firsthand how grateful we have to be that when the human body performs these functions. And he says uh, the urologist understands that it's no joke. And therefore, you know, it's something to be very, very grateful for. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, I was reading in the Yom Yosef, um, <clears throat> he quotes something from the Zohar saying that on Shabbos, it's almost every Friday afternoon, there's an announcement almost that rings out through all the sections of Gehenna or whatever. We can't really picture what that means. But it's an announcement that all the suffering of the sinners should stop for, for, for Shabbos. However, the sinners who were Mahalo Shabbos, the, the fires aren't extinguished for them, it says. Uh -huh. So um, my, question, my question is, he, he also says that because they didn't keep Shabbat in their existing, when they existed, it's almost as if they denied existence and they denied creation, which is like incredible sin, which was why the fires weren't extinguished for them. But my my question is, is, is could the Rob explain a little bit more about that subject? And is it true that it's not possible to like believe in existence or believe in a Shem whilst being Mahal Shabbos? Because I mean, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know a lot of cases where people like believe in Shem, believe in creation, but they're not mocked on Shabbos. Yeah, yeah, yes. This is very interesting. Indeed, there is a Chazal, the teaching of Chazal, that on uh, Shabbos. Uh, the fire of Gehenna is extinguished, and even the Rishayim in Gehenna get a respite. That Shabbos is so great and so wonderful that even the Rishayim uh, do not go back, or not in Gehenna, so to speak, or at least Gehenna is cooled down, whatever that means, whatever the fire Gehenim is on Shabbos. And that's one of the great, great blessings of how holy Shabbos is. Uh, the teaching, however, the other thing, that if you're Machalal Shabbos, the Gehenna isn't cooled down, that's a little bit of a chiddish. That in fact, the Pashas of the Chazal is everybody gets the break. But on the other hand, I understand the Svara. That if, I, if I didn't, if I wasn't Mach of Shabbos, why should Shabbos take care of me? Right? That's what the Zemmer says. Ki yeshmer Shabbos, keo yeshmerini. If I keep Shabbos, Shabbos will keep me. If I don't keep Shabbos, Shabbos won't keep me. Now, the idea though, the correlation that he was Mechal Shabbos is as if they deny that God created the world. That is a, a, an explicit Gemara that Chil Shabbos is a kfira b'maisa b'reishis, but, 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 we have some very, very interesting psukim in modern times. Everybody knows if a non-Jew touches wine, we're not allowed to drink the wine. We also know that if I am a Chalil Shabbos publicly and I touch wine, the wine is also forbidden, unless it's mavushal, unless it's cooked, cooked wine. And the reason is because a Mechalil Shabbos is identical to an idolater, based on that statement. Now, in the 19th century, with the rise of the reform movement, we have a very famous leniency of the Orach Laner, who is of Shimshon of Al-Hirsch's Rebbe, that says, Bizman Hazeh, that correlation is no longer true. It used to be that if you desecrated Shabbos, you were essentially declaring that I don't believe in God. 
Today, he says, because of the perversion of religious ideology, there are many, many people, exactly your point, there are many, many people who do believe in God, but they don't understand why they can't turn on an electric light or rip toilet paper. And therefore, he says, La halacha, bizman azah, a machalal Shabbos does not prohibit wine. Meaning, uh, a person doesn't keep Shabbos, he touches wine, you're allowed to handle it. And indeed, in America at least, many, many Rabbanim follow this psak. In Eretz Yisrael, they're, they're, they're a bit stricter, but Or Sameach itself follows this psak in JLE programs. I mean, most of our wine is Mavushal, so there's no problem. It's, it's cooked wine, but you know, the mentors are, are wine connoisseurs, so they like to bring uncooked wine, and the problem is a lot of the JLE kids are not Shomer Shabbos. So although you know, we wouldn't, you know, rabbi, rabbi, the rabbi or whatever, we wouldn't drink it, but, uh, you know, we allow it to be served based on this leniency of the binyan And So your svara is a, is a very good svara. It actually is stated that way. Is it true that, like, if you are Mahal Shabbos, it's as if you, like, because we know keeping Shabbos is, a, is, is as if you kept all of the mitzvot of the Torah and transgressing Shabbos is as if you've broken all of them. Yeah. Does that, does that still apply in the case with, like you're saying, who a JLE student, JLE student, or maybe someone who is even more secular and... Yes, yeah, so, so once again, I, I, I think you have a very good point. Uh, whether you call it, you can describe it a few ways. Whether you call it Tinok Shanishpas, like the baby that was kidnapped, or whether you say, well, the person is on the road to becoming from, or whether you say the person believes in God, he just doesn't have all of these ritual uh, observances. I, I think the bottom line is that you are right. The way we view a Mechalel Shabbos today would be different than in the time of time of Chazal. By the way, you should know, people don't realize this. Um, you know, when we think about Greek and Roman history, uh, we always identify it with Jew hatred. We think Antiochus, we think Titus, we think about, you know, all of the Goyim trying to destroy us. And indeed, there's certainly a lot of that, the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, etc. But you know, uh, there was a lot of what's called philo-Semitism. There were large segments of the Greek and Roman world that actually loved the Jewish people. In fact, part of why Romans were so, the Roman government, the Roman emperors, were so against the, against the Jews were because massive amounts of Romans wanted to convert to Judaism. And the Romans had to stop that. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. And it's shalom lishma, but a lot of what attracted the Romans was Shabbos. Hey, these Jews get a day off, they don't work. Sounds good. <laughs> and they wanted to kind of have Shabbos. It was Shabbos. So it's interesting. Today we look at Shabbos, well, because everyone has these weekends, but today we look at Shabbos as a burden. Oh, gee, I'm, I'm going to become Jewish, so I will not do all these things on Shabbos. Shabbos was a big, big, big attraction for converts in Roman times mm -hmm. because it was a day of rest which did not exist uh, in those ancient societies. Okay, uh, maybe we'll stop here, and uh, thank you. Have a good Shabbos.